Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the board and staff at IMFG, I am delighted to welcome you to today's virtual presentation on a self-help approach, urban design in ACRA's informal settlements. My name is Thomas Hatchard, and I'm the manager of programs and research here at the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Although this event is virtual and I realize that everyone is in a different location, I do wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many Indigenous people from across their island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. I'd like to thank the external funders of the Institute, uh, Havana Capital, Maytree, the City of Toronto, the Region of Halton, and the Region of York. I'd also like to uh, especially thank the School of Cities for funding IMFG's postdoctoral fellowship. And lastly, I would like to thank our team at IMFG and at the Monk School, Piali, Daria, and Adam for everything they've done to make this event happen today. If you're tweeting about the event, our hashtag is IMFG Talks and our Twitter, hand, Twitter handle is at IMFG Toronto. So today's event is the first of two seminars by our 2021-2022 postdoctoral fellow, Sichuan Wang, who will, goes by Andrew as well. His presentation builds on the doctoral research he did uh, on Ghana, uh, which looked at urban design and Accra's informal settlements. Uh, in this presentation, uh, he's by looking at the projects taken up by residents of informal settlements, Andrew uh, analyzes um, these projects through the lens of the literature on social movements. And he raises really interesting questions of governance and how we account for the work of actors who sit outside traditional decision-making frameworks. The, just logistically, the presentation will last for about half an hour, and then we're going to move straight into a Q&A. So please do use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens uh, and send in questions throughout the talk. We'll get to as many of them as we can. So uh, to move things forward, let me introduce Andrew to you. He is, as I mentioned, the 2021-2022 IMFG Postdoctoral Fellow, and he holds a Doctor of Sustainable Urbanism from Washington University in St. Louis. His area, area of interest uh, his areas of interest, sorry, include spatial inequality through different perspectives, scales, and themes to interpret how they may affect the broader pursuit of urban sustainability. Previously, he was a professional urban planner in the Urban Development Bureau of Kaohsiung City in Taiwan, where he focused on brownfield redevelopment and urban renewal. Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um... <laughs> so, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good to see you if you are in Toronto here, and this is lovely afternoon. So, that, my name is Xi Chun Wang. I go by Andrew, as Thomas has introduced earlier. Um, I want to use, before we begin, I want to spend some time to thank uh, Director Slack and Thomas, also PLE, to bring me to here, and also the School of City for their general responding to make this possible. And uh, also, I want to address like uh, today, the topic is uh, kind of a standing piece of my dissertation. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time to uh, wandering around and to find a right uh, positions to approach it. So if you find me have a scattering around of different themes, feel free to uh, ask any questions, comments, or uh, corrections in the Q and A box, and uh, we will try. I will try my best to respond to it and. Uh, I will try to make it as easy as uh, make the flow as easy to follow as possible. So uh, the formal presentation today is going to be in um, English. So if you find yourself easier to ask questions in Mandarin, you can key in here as well. I want to also thank my fellow in Ghana, if you are watching there in the afternoon, and also some people if you are in Taiwan. That's good morning. And so I'm going to um, talk, share my screen right now. Hold on a second, let me restart. All right. So is that good for you now? Um, Thomas, can you let me know? Yeah, that looks good. That's good, all right. <laughs> I want to spend some time to address the topic today and it's more than onto my observation on the self-help cases along in Accra. And I want to connect that to urban design and the theory of social movement in today's talk. 
and we'll see if my argument can stand in the end of the uh, talk. The first time I get involved and understand the idea of urban informality was in 2017. And I was funded by the school in Washington University to go to Johannesburg, study the uh, spatial inequality issue. And uh, this image uh, showed up and struck me in terms of this kind of contrast. On the left is the Blau Borson Bor uh, uh, gated neighborhood in Johannesburg. But on the right is a Kia Sand informal settlement. So it is this kind of order and this order, this contraction show my attention. And I want to go in deeper to understand more areas similar to Kia Sands informal settlement. And so that was the beginning. And this is today's agenda. My purpose is try to show you that how the self-help urban design in our cross informal settlements could be understood as a form of social movement. My argument is that uh, this sort of the residents in this settlement that have behaved and acting like the, like the unknowing urban designer through their self-help project demonstrated that this public space is, is being shaped. So I argue this movement is a form of social movement. To touch in on that, I want to address a couple of the literature review based upon my understanding on informal settlements, urban design and social movement literature. And in these sections, I'm going to articulate five different components uh, consisting uh, how do we evaluate uh, whether or not when uh, events can be considered as social movement. Later on, I will address some uh, context based upon the self-help cases in Accra. And after an analysis and providing some insights, I will conclude with some remarks. I believe that approaching to the idea of informal settlements, we need to have a big picture of the trends and challenges today. And globally, according to the United Nations, uh, there are about 1 billion people living in slum or informal settlement. And I have to argue, address that it is really depending on uh, the definition you apply. But generally, the feature coming after that is always regarding to uh, emerging housing need overpopulated and or in lake of infrastructure such as water or electricity, etc. And such a number is expected to be uh, growing up to 3 billion by 2030. So as a planner's perspective, I realize it's really no way for us to excuse around the need of providing or how do you accommodate so much population. So look at it, housing or infrastructure are just two aspects of that. So uh, I want to go in further in terms of what are we referring to in terms of uh, informal settlements here. Here are some examples. And according to Keith Hart and Kim Dovey, um, informality fundamentally is about the idea of something beyond control. It can be referring to some sort of the untaxed economy activities, et cetera. On the top right is the urban scape I'm going to address in today's talk uh, in terms of the informal settlements in Accra. But the informality itself is also have different diverse, but diverse perspective as well. Um, caged house, caged home, which is kind of located in Hong Kong, is also considered a form of informality because of the remodel and its violation to zoning. How about some cases in Taiwan? This is where I've been staying for more than 20 years, and it is also considered a form of informal settlement. And because of its violation to zoning code as well. It is not supposed to be there. However, uh, over these years, I never really feel like I, uh, I live in informal settlement at all. And I never really feel that like I have been left behind and not being provided with sufficient uh, housing needs, etc. So to this end, I want to argue that informality itself is really a dubious idea, depending on who's the actor saying what to be informal. And then we can kind of wrap it up to move on to some more idea on urban design. In terms of the objectivity, urban design as a subject, we can understand it through like a design of town or city, street or space. And, uh, or more broadly speaking, in terms of what, how do you design that or even provide it a framework, uh, considering the combination of these different components and to make sure we can have successful development. 
So uh, objectively, this is some so, uh, sort of how do we understand urban design as a uh, as a fundamental perspective. However, urban design also comes with some sort of the subjectivity as well. How do we define what is a good urban design? So that's the subjectivity perspective to see in this uh, idea. Um, um, Professor Mumper provided some sort of uh, sort of value in terms of maybe that's an architectural design uh, inter intertwined with the low rise pedestrian environment covered with some sort of public space, uh, public transportation to ensure that like, a built environment is kind of suitable for living. Jacob and also April are also per providing some sort of principle. And this, there are five uh, components they think it's kind of uh, the, the features, fe uh, features kind of composing, how do we define what is a good urban design project? And that will be leading to a better urban life. So to this point, I want to show you that uh, urban design also comes with some sort of a certain expectations that they, they are expected to meet, to met. So, and this expectation is immense even today. The niche of this talk, I want to borrow, uh, borrow from uh, Professor Carmona's a very interesting note, thinking about the two different groups of urban designer. The knowing urban designer in terms of seeing themselves as really urban design practitioner. So they kind of help us to understand what's the vision and try to do some sort of visualization helping us to think about, imagine what the future looks like after the design project. However, there are also another group is so-called the unknowing urban designer, which can range from the politicians, community members, all the way to household, householders as well. And this group of people, they engage with urban design practice, but somehow not being appreciated about what they are doing. And so-called, for example, for these two comparison, like one is in the real world, which, Kind of embodily presenting the people who presently living here and enrich the space. So somehow, if we compare the visualization and the real world, it's not difficult to realize there are always some minimum differences. But somehow, according to my literature review, they are not much understanding to deep into like how this kind of un unknowing urban designer behave and shaping the places as they are today. And since that, I'm looking at informal settlement of their self help. A project, I believe that I'm following this direction. In terms of moving to some sort of very brief literature on the uh, social movement, this is uh, a lot of the knowledge generated from this literature, and it comes with also a lot of different definition as well. But uh, briefly speaking, uh, it involved kind of, uh, according to Tilly, is a sustained challenging to the authority. And in this process, it involved a lot of different actions and a lot of different actors. They try to kind of head into one uh, very specific goal, like how do you move on to create real social change goals, depending on what's the ending goal they are pursuing. And in this process, it is the group that they are having some sort of unhappiness or some sort of resistance. They try to achieve that goal through different uh, approaches. And according to Maria Deli, uh, Mario Delia, there are four uh, Diani, There are four types of the trends in uh, social movement literature. And starting from Turner and Kidian and back to the 1960s, uh, it was studying about a collective behavior. They were understanding like uh, why people, when they are getting crowded and they become irrational, why you are doing wrong thing. But the question they didn't ask is that why, whether or not the system has any problem, such as whether or not our education system or political system has any problem in it. Later on, it has kind of been further developed by McCarthy and Zell into the 70s, uh, providing the resource mobilization. They ask, actually, we think people are rational. They mobilize because they have grievance. And to their perspective, this grievance is driven by the resource inequality, such as someone has more opportunities, someone has more resources, someone has more materials. And that's the reason why we have grievance. And such a theory further be developed by T.D. and McAdam into the 80s. Uh, they proposed political process theory. Such a theory consider a movement as a process, not really just focusing on individual behavior. So they, they, they argue that this protest, they go out to walk on the street and try to demonstrate their willingness just because 
most of the what they are pursuing cannot be achieved through formal channel, more specifically about the vote or campaign. And the last trend is uh, derived, uh, derived from Europe, which is called a new social movement, uh, which kind of shifting away from material side perspective, but leaning onto the identity politics, focusing on gender issues, environmental issues, and ethnic issue as well. And uh, coming up to, uh, I'm going to focus on more leaning onto Tilly and McAdams uh, framework because they provide a couple components to help us understand more of how to evaluate it. But before we move on, I want to point out a couple of the literature uh, gaps. First of all, it seems to us that like they are always seems to be have something that is kind of social movement organization they need to be resisting. We are not happy about something. And uh, according to Doc Mc, uh, McAdams, uh, he said, you know, if we didn't involve any protests on the street, could we even consider this event as social movement? And lastly, we also realized that most of these events or experiences are driven from Europe and the United States as well. That's a three major theme I realized after this kind of literature review. The components falling within the social movement, I'm going to tease them out uh, with some sort of intro here. First of all, the political opportunity structure, which in terms of like whether or not we have any opportunities to, su to succeed if we mobilize. So that's the perspective to see any kind of events happening on the street. The second thing is about mobilizing, mobilize, mobilizing structure. What's the, uh, what's the presented uh, social movement organization out there? How do I get engaged with this kind of movement? Thirdly, in terms of the framing process, how the leader taking the lead and uh, uh, cultivating a call for actions, convincing people to come out and do some uh, different actions. How about the frequency? How long do you protest? How frequent do you go out to on the street or even uh, presenting your petition? Lastly, is about the contextual repertoire, which kind of linking on to what approach you are applying. So starting from strike, boycott, protest, petitions as well. So with all these five components here, I'm going to uh, go into, I uh, zooming into my cases and then I will come back to use this framework to see how it goes. Speaking of Accra, and for people not really haven't got a chance to visit a city, I'm going to address a little bit about where it is. Accra is the capital city in Ghana, which sits in West Africa. And based upon the latest population estimation, there are 30 million people national wide living in Ghana. And according to that report, there are about 5 million people living in greater Accra region, which in terms of like greater Accra region is this territory. And uh, the latest report from uh, Accra Metropolitan District, uh, which is in this particular territory, there are about 80% of the labor forces that do not really work. And they, they, grow, they work in the private sectors and especially in the informal sectors. And also adding on that, there are 60% of people that live in this informal housing. So in that regard, informality is really a driving forces that's kind of consolidating what the urbanity really is today in Accra. And I'm going to zoom in further in terms of the cases and it's kind of scaling it down to here. On this map, it comes with a couple of the features. The green one is the uh, contemporary, uh, officially recognized informal settlement in Accra. The red one is the historical uh, informal settlement, which has, which has been here for a while, maybe around 60 years, since the beginning of the 1957, when Accra as a town adopted its first plan. And the specific settlements I'm looking at is Accra New Town, which sits about three miles north from the city center down here. And this settlement has another feature is uh, it's a migrant settlement, a stranger settlement, meaning like most of the people, they moved to here during a period of time and they are mostly from North Ghana or the other country. And the self-help cases distributed along this strand. And this is the Nima stream. Nima stream is a water body studied from Accra, inform, uh, its airport all the way down to Odo River. And the particular section I'm going to look at is this one is called Nima drain. And Nima drain is one particular drain that kind of be intervened back to the eighties when uh, kind of governmental installation for upgrading project. And it comes with a couple of the different uh, historical uh, meaning 
based upon different scale. To the country as a whole, it was during period of time when Ghana was adopting and uh, receiving uh, structure adjustment program. Uh, in brief, it's a lending program uh, for the wealthier country uh, to lending some money to Ghana. And that was a period of time when Ghana was uh, running into a great uh, economy depression. So in that period of time, uh, when the money coming from the World Bank and also IMF, it's kind of asking the country to also accepting the criteria. You need to open up your, liberalize your economy activities. At the same time, that also, because there are not a much job out to the uh, rural area, people start to move into the city. So that's why to Accra as a whole, it becomes the process when the city started to expand from south all the way to north. And Accra Newtown become one of the settlements people are starting to settle in. So when it become populated, there are much, much more issues coming up in terms of how do we increase the uh, livability here? How do we address the flooding issue? and doing some sort of intervention here. And remember, when the World Bank providing money to the country, they also hoping that we can create some sort of public work, increasing the labor intense activities. And the drainage interventions become one good uh, avenue for them to invest and try to hire more immigrant neighborhood coming here to do the work. And how does that look like? This is a picture I find during the period of time when the Lima drain was started being intervened. And uh, I want to invite you to think about two different perspectives on this picture. For those members who kind of dig, using their bare hand to kind of dig in the drain, and I'm, I'm wondering what's on their mind. Imagine yourself as a migrant who moved from North Ghana all the way to the city, try to earn a living. And you, when you get your first job in here and you try to get some more money and sending them back to your family in rural area, what's on your mindset? At the same time, I'm thinking about those people who are living here for more than 10 years, 20 years, and looking that there is a specific project happening on your backyard. What's on their mind? I would say maybe they are thinking about something is happening here. Maybe we can stay here longer as well. The outcome of the project, I would say, is pretty astonishing. Starting from the left to right is a time frame from 70 all the way to 2020 today. It's kind of being uh, photoshopped on the same spot. So you will see how it has changed over time from left to right. And I want to invite you to look at uh, this picture in two different uh, perspectives. The first thing is the intersection between the building down to the drain. And we can see that it has been gradually being stabilized and also been given with different function as well. In this case, it become a road where people can pass through for their daily activities. The second perspective is really about looking at these buildings. It has gradually been be, be introduced with more durable material. And also it has been kind of sticking up with higher uh, uh, building in this regard. So we can see that the transformation of the Nima drain helped the neighborhood to transform at the same time. And upon the installation of the Nima drain, it also encouraged the neighborhood to start to do some sort of the self-help project. Project that kind of sort of being planned, designed, constructed, operated, or even replanned by themselves. And I got the opportunity to really walk along this train and documenting all these kind of projects that have happened. And then I'll try to understand the story behind. And I'm going to use a couple of them to address my following talk. The first one is going to be the second, uh, second self-help drain, which sits here. The owner who sits under the shelter was the very easy approach people. When I, when I, get, I get to him and having a conversation with him, I asked him, how did this project ever become a reality? He said he has been staying here since the installation of the Nima drain. And over the decades, he, he realized he becomes a member here and he tried to do something good to the neighborhood. And with that motivation, he reached out to all the neighborhood and asked him for a piecemeal contribution. More specifically, it's about a free labor hour or some sort of mini money who are willing to provide it to him to do this project. In that regard, it is a, after a couple, uh, couple of the months, the project has been greatly recognized by the community here, and they come in to support him. And I asked him following up in terms of where do you see the future of this project? He said, you know, 
there is no specific time frame that uh, asking me to do this now and do that later. As long as I'm staying here as a member, and as long as I also have available labor and funds, I will try to maintain the place in terms of its quality, as well as to make sure we can improve it further in the future. I really see a sense of community here. The second case is the playground, which also sits next to the Lima drain. And this uh, playground is one of the most organized places I've seen when I'm in Accra. And more specifically in terms of uh, throughout the day in different period of time, there are always people knowing when, when should, uh, who, which team should come here to play. And when will we have some sort of funeral? wedding or even kind of elderly program that would happen on this playground. Everything is kind of organized through their informal conversation. So they become the authority, they decided what to happen and in a very neat approach. And to that regard, I realized it has been commonized for the people and they use it and also civilian to try to maintain the space as well as to help us to keep watch on those kids who kind of being used, coming to use the place to understand what's going on here. And the last piece ending on to that is all this kind of micro economy business happening surrounding this area. So I can see that it's really making a change and, and a change to the neighborhood. The last case I'm going to show you first with two video. <laughs> Now it's a bridge that can kind of be constructed in 2021, February, before the outbreak of COVID. And uh, the owner, Sui, who stands right above the bridge, um, was the one who owned the bridge. And uh, I asked him in terms of the same questions with the other owners. And he shared with me a very interesting story um, about how he get his support. So he used WhatsApp, essentially a, a, a digital a platform to reach out to the member of parliament and the politicians in, in, in the neighborhood. And he reached to him saying that he wanted to do some good project that's kind of helping the connection between two neighborhoods. And after a while, he got support in terms of all these sands and bricks and the woods that comes afterward for him to conduct the project. And so that's how it becomes a reality. And I want to draw your attention in terms of compare what happened here to the social movement theory. And the contextual repertoire tells us that it asks how this kind of movement attempt to achieve goal. Most of the time it involves strike, boycott, protest, people on the street to demonstrate what they are pursuing. But in this case, it's more leaning onto how did you engage with the informal way to the politician and uh, providing your opinion and asking them for some sort of support? It also involved about loving your neighborhood, asking the permit or permission for them, and it also getting some support from them. And the last thing is also kind of consulting this kind of this, uh, skilled informal workers. Some skill set can be provided to help them come into here to understand how the project can be built and to make sure it is safe enough for the kids to go through. And I would argue also the most important thing is like, it, is, it, it created a public spaces where people can do and come here to chill after a day of work and try to understand each other more. So that's really a momentum behind to shaping this kind of self-help bridge. The last one I want to borrow is kind of understanding how the norm is also being framed along a pedestrian space. When I was working on this trend, I also realized a, a, a need to document how the pedestrian space been really used or even created. And in different sections, it comes with different conditions. So I categorize them into four different categories. The first one is through and viewable. Essentially, it means that you can go through the pedestrian space without any uh, disconnection. 
And it also provided with a more comfortable width, like a width enough for you to go through. The second one is through, but with re relatively limited uh, steps. And in this case, it's, you can still go through it, but somehow you can feel a little bit uncomfortable because it didn't provide enough space to kind of run into each other. The third one is hindered but viewable. In this case, like the route has been disconnected, but somehow because it provides some sort of additional spaces where you can go by through and detour. The worst case is a hinder, but with also with limited width. In this case, it's a worst scenario. You need to kind of wait for a couple of minutes for people to come here and you can go. And what surprised me is like in most of the cases, the through and vehicle is a general, generally distributed. Most of the condition is falling into this category. And my question is why, how does that happen? Remember the people come into the settlement because they need a place to stay. And if I'm the owner, perhaps I would write, try to find and kind of do not retain the public space. I would kind of use it for my pri private compound, but that is, not, that is not a case here. And I found, my, uh, I found my answer when I reached to one of the uh, household ladies. She was trying to pave the road and then maintain the pedestrian width. And I asked him why she wanted to do this. She said, you know, it's a common sense. We, we need to, it's a neighborhood and we need to maintain these kind of public spaces for people to get through. It's safer, it's also more convenient to the neighborhood. I really see a sense of how the social norm be formed and it's kind of quietly consolidated, but somehow it's also visible presented to me. So before we move on to the comparison with the other five components, I want to leave you with three takeaway before we move on. And the first one is the sediment transformation. The installation of the Nima drain really bring in the reason of why people being attracted to here and allowing to then to stay here longer. And they, choose to stay and then move on to prosper as well. It also tells us something about the community participations. In the beginning of the installation of the NIMA drain, there people go out to supervise the understanding whether or not the project or the progress of the project has been fulfilled. Today, it's more on to how do you engage with these kind of self-help activities and how did you contribute or kind of take a lead as well, I would say. The third thing is about a sense of permanence the materiality that has happened here. People own the spaces and they try to bring in more doable materials, starting from the intersections all the way to the building. And lastly, it's about the pedestrian spaces. And this kind of norm is kind of forming there. People follow the route and understanding what we should fit into the need to the neighborhood. So to the end, I want to address that the grievance is not disappear. It is still there. People still try to have a better living environment. However, this grievance is not being used to go out to the street to protest. It has been used on here to do our community building and also norm shaping. So imagine that to all the components I have addressed earlier. First, like in terms of political opportunity structure, we realize that there is no one really prevent you from doing the right thing. However, upon seeing you, if you are trying to do some harm, such as in the playground to not follow the rule, we will stop you. So that's the first thing we realized in, realize in this stru structure. In terms of the mobilization structure, and uh, we realized that people try to get into using their individual network and expanding that through your, this kind of informal connections to the politicians to try to make sure you can get your support and get engaged. So they are more like taking the lead in this process. The framing process in terms, in this case, like all the owner knows the project involved different stages and we use our limited resources to do what we can do. And the fourth perspective, thinking about a construction, this kind of cycle, and we, we, we realize that the norm shaping is molding onto how frequent do we recognize this work? How do people appreciate someone is doing the right thing to the community? The last part is like, uh, most interesting part is the uh, avenue you use, the repertoire. And in this case, they are using more on the small chat with a politician, lobbying your neighborhood and try to maybe asking some sort of skilled worker to come to do some services. In the end of that, we realized that there is no really a strike or boycott and there is no such a protection, uh, protection uh, protect, protest cycle as well. 
So I realized it's really an invisible social movement. We don't take a picture and then showing that people walking on the street, but somehow we just try to build it based upon our capacity. I want to leave you with this page uh, in terms of uh, rephrasing what has happened in the past 20, 20 to 30 minutes. The purpose is to try to show you that it's kind of self-help urban design in Accra. It's really a form of social movement. What I found is that most of these cases match the components of social movement, but somehow the repertoire is far away from the conventional mobilization approach, which involved protests or strike derived from UK and United States and also Europe. The implications derived from this research, uh, there are two of them. One is that I argue the invisible social movement has led to this visible so, uh, self-help urban design. The stakeholders understand what they need and they try to mobilize by themselves to meet their needs. So that's the first takeaway. And also they try to build up kind of unsteady rule for a rule for people to routinely follow. Secondly, I argue that informal settlement planning really, really need different perspective to know how the place is being shaped. Acknowledging this self-help effort is just the beginning of this conversation. In the future, I want to use my following time to conduct it uh, deeper in terms of understanding the physical condition and the infrastructure uh, intervention in Accra. With that being said, I want to uh, thank you again for being here and listening to my observation on the placemaking and also showing you the experiences from Accra, articulating why the players role are so different in South and Global South. I want to thank again to the city uh, School of Cities. I am FG and the Mount School for hosting me here in Toronto, and also everyone I met in this journey to make this research possible. And lastly, I want to um, take any questions and any critique, any comments from you as well. And if we cannot go through all of them, by chance, you can feel free to drop me a line and send me an email. I would be love to catch up with you guys. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Andrew. That was fantastic. Um, a really insightful and uh, thought provoking presentation. Um, <clears throat> as Andrew said to everyone in the audience, please, we're gonna take your questions now. So um, do uh, pop any questions you may have for him in the Q and A box and uh, we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, but just to start us off, Andrew, I, I have a question for you. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's very interesting the way that your presentation examines these, these self-help projects um, in, through the lens of social movements. Um, and I, so I'm curious whether in your research, did you find there was any kind of coordination between residents on these projects? And if you didn't find that, how does that fit into the, the social movement analogy? Yeah, um, thank you, Thomas. Yeah, I, I, I believe, yes. <laughs> I didn't really get a chance uh, when I was visiting there uh, to get involved more in terms of the informal organizations. I'm speaking more than onto the uh, growth of the youth development program that has kind of weekly happened. <laughs> it's kind of thriving. And so uh, I understand that and I know that's the, the theme that I'm merging there. And so I understand that that definitely happened. And another case is the, um, a very interesting thing is the monthly they have the drainage cleaning exercise. <laughs> so that leading on to the assembly men, which is uh, based on different electoral district, they are being assigned with different assembly men and they are taking the lead. It's not paid, it's unpaid. So they are behave to mobilize the people to join them to do cleaning the drainage. So uh, that's really a very interesting exercise that happening. And I believe that during that process, they will realize, so the neighborhood get engaged in this process, they will understand, well, we need some other project here as well. <laughs> so I believe that coordination happened in that community uh, motivate or mobilization process. Right, yeah, no, that's interesting. and and. Um, we're starting to get some questions in, so please do keep sending them. But one person in the audience uh, had a comment sort of earlier in your presentation as you were talking about social movements. Um, and then later, I mean, and they said the, the, the frameworks you spoke of, the social movement frameworks, uh, reflect what is currently happening in Ghana. Um, and then they said the member of parliament from Medina yesterday led a demonstration of the citizens to demand for provision of roads. Um, and, you know, and he uh, mentioned that protests are, have now started. So I'm curious, you know, I think 
that uh, I'm wondering how you see the relationship between um, the the community building of self help projects that you've seen and the way that you you associate social movements. Um, does that you know is it instead of protest? Does it at some point lead to protests if you know the grievances you speak to some maybe get um, um, uh, get too too bad? You know how, how do you see that relationship um, moving? Sure. Um, yeah. sure, that's a great question, and so. Um, I think that's part of the niche between uh, the conventional way of understanding social movement. And I will bring up a more critical question is like, what's the social change goal we are pursuing? So if you put that as a brown hand, it's a similar thing in terms of in, in North America, like a Black Lives Matter. <laughs> so the movement is not about community building, it's more asking for social justice. So that's the ending goal. So that's why that approach has been taken. But in this case, uh, the way I'm pursuing this kind of self-help effort is thinking like we using the construction or the community building as the ending goal. And I want to add in on to that is also understanding urban reality. So in this case, most of the people know uh, most of the uh, the local authority didn't have that much. I'm talking about the government, especially, specifically for the assembly. Mm -hmm. They have physical constraint in that regard. So you cannot wait until anyone to come to help you. And everyone knows that. <laughs> so uh, from the resident's perspective, from the government's perspective, it's just a common sense in terms of who will take on the responsibility of fulfilling this need. So that's, that's that particular thing. But coming back to the question, essentially, I think the first thing is the, um, the idea of where is the ending goal? What are we pursuing? And it's just taking different avenues in the end. Right, yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. Um, someone actually uh, had a question about um, the official city planner. So like moving from what you were saying about the, the, the local government and, and, and its presence or lack of presence. So the question is, um, where is the quote unquote official city planner in this self-help urban design? In other words, is there any interaction between the social movements and the public, public officers? That's a great question. And that's basically my lifelong journey is going to sticking onto that. Um, I think about this from time to time and uh, that's uh, something I'm going to keep pursuing. But I would coming back to one thing is the, in this case, maybe it's very unique in a way is like Accra New, Newtown is lucky to have a project like uh, Nima Train. That's the beginning of the story. And because of this public input, and perhaps we will use a term is like critical infrastructure installation, trigger all this following movement. And uh, so I think that's where the planners in the global south need to kind of think about what do we mean by critical project that can rainbow and adding on, rampling all this following effect. So adding on that is that where is the boundary of the planners and what you can do with your limited resources. And, and that will be somewhere shaping into what's the planners role in the rounding. And it's not ending yet. So uh, adding on uh, the Nima drain today, or we should call it the Odo River, it's also undergoing another round of uh, resilient planning. Mm -hmm. They are trying to reinventing the project to do it again. That's another piece I haven't shared in this talk, but I would love to talk more if you want later on, just let me know. <laughs> yep, that's great. Um, and I do see some people who have raised their hands, just so everyone knows, um, we're, we can't call on you to, to speak. So please, if you have questions or even if there's their, their comments, please put them in the q and if, if they are just comments and we don't get to them, we will be sending everything that's in the Q&A uh, to Andrew afterwards, so he'll be able to read them and and um, and respond to you uh, privately if 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 that is uh, required. Um, so, moving on that question is sort of, of of the of government and 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 there's someone had a question about power relations. So, how did you they ask how did you find power relations were structured? Uh, they make a comment: elected officials can exploit service scarcity and access for votes. So, was there any reshuffling of power relations? Um, or changes in rent seeking behavior. So did you see, um, was there exploitation between the elected officials and the, and the residents or um, how, how were the power relations between, between those two? Can you maybe expand a bit more on that? Yeah, um, it's speaking of, um, I, I know someone know more than me <laughs> on this question, 
I know understand. I do understand the power dynamic and the differences with that. And I can only tell from my short visit there, comparing to the other researcher who spent more than two years down there and then focusing on democracy development there. They they uh, better answer to that. And I would try. I would address this by this way. The uh, the that I see there is a very unique role of the assemblyman, if that ever makes sense. And uh, it also related to on the electoral structure, like the assemblyman has their different, uh, the lead is sort of the, the, the chair or they call it, um, what's the name, executive, is sort of being assigned <laughs> by someone else. So that's kind of really control uh, mm -hmm. by, by really top down approach. And uh, I, 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 was, I was dipping into that, but I cannot really answer this uh, very, very interesting question, but I cannot really address from my experience by now. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, no, of course. There was, there's a question here about um, your methodology, um, so trying to get behind the scenes. Um, how did you establish contact with the people in the informal settlements? Um, uh, as in the question asked, how did you approach the local residents as an outside as an outsider um, so that they would be open to chat and to be observed? Mm -hmm. Thanks for the methodological uh, question. First of all, I always, um, I don't know if I, one of my fellow here, as a scholar, um, when I was on the ground, I realized only speaking to Accra is the, you need to sort of have an introduction later. <laughs> So okay. I do find one, which is Professor James, if he's here. He helped me to uh, supervise saying that he know what I'm doing in the ground. So I have that piece of authority first. And then secondly, it's like I approach the people in terms of using network. So also this assemblyman, again, I interview all of them to have a sense because they can help me to understand more about what's going on. And focusing on drainage is also mm -hmm. uh, leading onto their introduction, saying like, we see the most challenging part in the neighborhood is drainage. And so that's why it opened up all this kind of history behind. So uh, that's really two ways. One is like, uh, where is your professional uh, background helping you? So that's why my leader helped me to providing my um, kind of my, in, my, I'm taking it seriously. <laughs> the second part is uh, how did you reach to uh, local opinion leaders? And it's like a snowball process. They will help you to direct to anyone who will be willing to tell you more. And I won't say it's easy. Uh -huh. I run into <laughs> one of the, um, who is that? Uh, they call it chief. I think it's chief, yeah, chief. And then I run into, uh, also in Accra Newtown, I visit him maybe 10 times. He is not willing to see me and not willing to talk to me until the last time uh, before I leave, like two days before I get on the plane and then I jump into him and then talk to him. He said, what do you want? <laughs> and I said, I only want to know more about the neighborhood. And so it turns out well. Right. No, that's interesting. Um, we have two comments here um, that I'll put out there and maybe you can just respond, um, respond to them, but they're interesting. So one one person writes, um, I think that social movements are both visible and invisible. In some cases, residents of informal settlements are just trying to fill an unmet need. In other instances, it's an attempt to push for the fulfillment of the social contract. And the other comment um, asks, you know, how, does the social, um, to the self-help movement or the, the, what you're speaking of, do they help in community building rather than, dis rather than disturbing formal city planning? So I guess I'm curious if you have any comments mm -hmm. about this kind of contrast or between, you know, doing what you need, filling this unmet need and this larger uh, social contract that you're trying to fulfill. Is, is, um, how, what's the relationship there? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the question. I, 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 in speaking to the first one, I think that's, uh, how do I say that? Um, as again, uh, I approach to social movement theory and in terms of the visible way, and I argue that perhaps that's an invisible one because it's not as the image we see, such as the riot back to January 6th in America. Like it's not something you see or people protest on. It's not, it's not something visible presenting to you. And, but in this case, it's sort of the, so I agree with you, like it's informal, it's invisible, but somehow some of them is visible, but perhaps that's just going back to how the theory is addressed about that. And the second question in terms of how the authentic planners role 
in between. I would say it's a great challenge. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's that's a similar issue in terms of earlier one. In terms of what's the planner's role in this? Seems to be chaotic, but somehow really organized urban scape and what's the behave afterward. And uh, that's a learning process. But I want to borrow from uh, one of the professor, uh, Vanessa Watson, who wrote a lot about Global South planners and thinking about the planners role. But uh, uh, the detail is not, it can be further developed. But one thing she pointed out is the, the context and the place are much more important <laughs> than planning uh, skill or setting. And yeah. so uh, using on that, I would say, really, really understand how the place become what they are. That would be at least the baseline for all the planners to know at the beginning, mm -hmm. because the mechanism happened or have to work. If something is just unpredictable, but somehow understanding why they are doing things this way, that would be the starting point. Right, yeah. And we have someone else here, and um, I think it relates to what people said before asking, you know, what you call protest, can it be also described in terms of a struggle for livelihood? So I think that sort of relates back to what um, what the previous people were saying about some, this, this question about the unmet need. So um, one, per yeah, um, one person asks um, if your exploration and research has included the UN covenant on social and economic rights. Um, have you explored that document? Does, have you found it related or is, is, has that been part of your research? Oh, can you say that again, UN document? The UN covenant on social and economic rights. So oh, if no. you haven't, maybe that is the next area to explore. Uh, <laughs> that's a point of doing this presentation as well. Yeah. <laughs> to know no. more about what's going on out there. That's great. Yeah. Um, I have another question from me. I'll I'll take the uh, the opportunity. Um, uh, so you know, one thing I found was really great about your research is that how it highlights, you know, how some work doesn't quite fit into straightforward planning or policy making processes. And so the projects you work on aren't, you know, aren't necessarily seen as examples of urban design, like you mentioned, and maybe, and, and the people who do them don't necessarily see themselves as urban designers in the same way that the NEMA drain would, is considered, considered urban design and urban infrastructure. Um, and if you extend that, you know, in a protester even who influences, influences policy, policy design may not always be considered part of the policy process. So I wonder if you could speak a bit more about how you think we need to expand our traditional thinking about social movements or policy making more jet more broadly to include these um, these actors who mainly um, are not recognized all the time. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, uh, it reminds me one thing yesterday because I was reading uh, watching a video saying that why global planning are so important to our traditional planning education. And that was Faranak uh, uh, Marafa. And so she argued that uh, it's really about, uh, it's so critical to understand there is no isolated planning that's not connected to the other world, <laughs> especially today because everything is digitalized and it's sort of like globally connected. So coming back to here, I would address it's essentially, again, using Vanessa Watson's perspective, like how did you really recognize that? And I would say it's, you like it or not, it's happening. Like people are more skilled in terms of understand how they can go through either formal channel or informal channel to push the boundary mm -hmm. of if you are only focusing on planning, but I'm not going to address, it's a similar thing in terms of the more social perspective or planning or economical perspective planning, all then is sort of using on that. But people are relatively um, knowledgeable and well-educated knowing that how do they plan this game. So in terms of a planner, I believe it's just a time of evolving, understanding how did you be more transparent and openness in terms of how they are getting involved and try to providing either informal way or informal way. It's just a way of being accepting. And when the times come, it's just, it's, it's a movement. And like, no one can really uh, stepping back saying that, no, we, we are good and we are not getting involved. I don't think that's the right position to take out. Right, yeah. And there's, there's one comment here that, you know, I think really resonates in terms of that, you know, there isn't necessarily, we can't say a, 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 too much distinction between, um, you know, different countries in this way. Um, they mentioned that in Toronto, some homeless people had to resort to forming settlements in public spaces 
due to the lack of uh, suitable housing support. Um, and they're wondering about what lessons might be gleaned from Accra in terms of how do you empower user groups to design future housing solutions. Do you see a way of how the work that you you know that you've done in in uh, in Ghana and Accra translates into something maybe more in, in in the states where you studied or in Canada where you're now living? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, um, and thanks for asking that. I I, I have to confess that all the time I, I like jogging, especially today. I will do that later. And I run into a lot of hopelessness as well. So I understand in terms of the uh, person or privatize this common ground, if that, if that makes sense. Like you take it and then try to stay there. And how does that? And I think the homeless issue involves so much. It's it's a little bit more complicated than than the movement. And I borrow the cases in Ghana, and especially I spend some time to address why the people they come to here and involving structural adjustment program, all, all, all adding on to that. So uh, in that case, they are kind of, they having the authority of staying here. To be honest, like there is no way of wiping them out. <laughs> That's not even an option. And they become the neighborhood. And it's a little bit tricky in terms of what's happening in terms of homeless occupying this public spaces and try to at least have their living right. And uh, I, I found that to be a fascinating question. I want to go in deeper. And I see the connection between that is the praising housing need, <laughs> but the different contexts providing different solution. And in here, perhaps the more like soft skill, I would turn like educational and economy skill is more important than physical intervention in Accra if that ever makes sense, because that's different issue in that regard, and that would involve a different intervention perspective. Right. Okay, well, I think we're, we're running out of time, so um, we're gonna end it there. It was, um, I think we got through most, most of the questions. Um, so I just wanna um, thank you, Andrew, again, for the very, the fantastic presentation. As I said, I mean, not only was the, the content was interesting, it's always interesting to see what's going on in, in cities around the world, but um, I think the analysis you brought to it really raises some interesting questions around, around governance and, and around how we just think about uh, design and planning and, um, and policy makers. So, so thank you so much. Um, and to everyone who attended, thank you for, for being here and for your questions. Uh, today's event has been recorded. Um, and so it's gonna be available on the IMF, IMFG website soon. Um, and so you please share that with your colleagues um, who couldn't att attend um, if they would be interested. Um, and so I will leave it at that. Thank you everyone for coming and enjoy the rest of your afternoon and evening. <laughs>